Hi there, and welcome to the Japanese preliminaries final day. And today we have four of the best players in Japan. We saw them yesterday qualifying. We saw all four players yesterday as well in the matches we saw, so that's good for us. I'm Lorinda, and with me is one of the faces of the Hearthstone Championship Tour. He's doing his first APEC event, and it's Sotl. Sotl, who caught your eye yesterday out of these four players? Um, it's an excellent question. Um, I think the, the standout player from what we saw was undoubtedly Gundam Flame, um, who you see being introduced at the moment very conveniently. I think he impressed me primarily with his, his recognition of when to be aggressive with some of the decks he was playing and just listening to the interviews there that you heard in the intro. Uh, my Japanese is, is definitely not perfect. I've spent some time in Japan, but nowhere near enough to be able to understand those things fluently. But I think... Even with no knowledge of Japanese, you could make up the word, make out the words aggro and shaman a few <laughs> times during that interview, which probably tells you everything you need to know. This guy obviously likes playing aggressive decks, and he played them incredibly well on day one, and he's the guy that I'm looking out for here. Right, and you say about him playing the aggressive decks really well. The play, I think, that caught us both like as the best play of the day was was actually a defensive well not a defensive play but it was a patient play with druid where he could have just cleared and made a huge board on turn two against zoo but instead he just chose to sort of take his time a little bit right there was also there was also a play later on which was a particularly aggressive play where he just straight up ignored a violet teacher against druid and pushed face and it wasn't like it was going for the kill he pushed face to go from like 28 to 24 or something like that and ended up winning that game by one damage at the end so um, amazing recognition of you know um, what, what his win condition is as an aggro deck and how early in the game he can push. And I'm really looking forward to seeing him play more. But he, I don't believe, is going to be the subject of our first game here. I think our first game is on the other side of the bracket, if I'm not mistaken. Right, as I understand it, our first game is um, Yuturi versus Napika. Um, yep. Just to point out to people watching, this is going to be best of seven. It's Conquest. The winner goes to the Apex Championship, as Jason Chase said there at the start. Um, basically, what's happening is that we are broadcasting over the Japanese feed, and at times we don't have much information. So bear with us on those times. In fact, quite frequently, we don't have much information. But yeah. So when I'm saying things like, we think it's this matchup, you know, it's not because we haven't done our research, we've done it as best we can. But, you know, there were quite a few technical issues at times yesterday, and we, we sometimes left guessing a little bit. We hope it didn't spoil your enjoyment. So I'm going to go with that this is Yutori versus Napika. They are both playing similar lineups class-wise, apart from uh, Yutori's got Rogue and Napika's got Mage. But Napika's playing some interesting decks, Sotl. He is, and uh, primarily the, the main candidate amongst that is the, the OTK Charge Arcane Giants patron deck that he's playing, which is um, a deck I think Senef Glass was the first person to catch on to when Arcane Giants were released in, uh, in one of the wings of Karazhan. And it, it kind of spread from there where... It's it's almost just the Wargan OTK shell, but the, the the fewer spots that you need on combo pieces means that you can kind of fit the patron engine in there as well. Um, so it's a it's a weird collection of a bunch of different decks, but it's a, a pretty powerful deck that um, after a first game with it that was quite shaky, I'd have to say, he then tightened up and piloted particularly well in the second time that we saw it. So I'm looking forward to see which side of the coin it comes down on this time, because honestly, we've seen... We've seen both sides yeah. of, uh, of Epica's play in the first day already. We've, we've seen some shaky mistakes and we've also seen some really solid plays. So. And it was really interesting because when he actually seemed to improve was after a technical mistake, like hardware mistake, that seemed to be his fault. Like something along the lines of he pulled the mouse out. Um, yeah. It wasn't like a disconnect because that wouldn't have been deemed his fault. Whatever it was, was deemed his fault. And then yeah. after that, he got better at the game. <laughs> yeah, somehow, yeah. It's a, maybe maybe he he just he just needed a a higher quality mouse just to improve his Hearthstone ATM. <laughs> his APM. Yeah. Wow. Uh, nice feature here. We are getting to see the deck lists for Napika going through there. Um, this version of Mage not completely dissimilar to one that's just taken number one legend somewhere. No, that is a, that is a very good point. Um, my my complexity teammate, uh, Mr. Asmodai, has just taken rank one legend with a slow tempo mage. Essentially, you know, it's almost like early game tempo mage, late game control mage. Um, try and use the tempo mage shell to control, and then have late game win conditions, which makes sense to me in a way because 
you you often see tempo mages doing that anyway, right? They're, yeah. they're off the board quite early, and they're just frostbolting things and fireballing things and waiting for a swing. Um, difference now is that by putting some some old school cards back in the deck, honestly, Emperor Thorasan, Archmage Antonidas, Flame Strike. These are cards that haven't really been in the deck for mm -hmm. quite a while. By putting those cards back in, suddenly you're prepared and comfortable to operate in the late game. Whereas with the other builds of the deck, even the ones that do include Babbling Books and Cabalist Tomes, because they don't have those late game win conditions, they still feel like they're flying by the seat of their pants on the on the last few turns, trying to scrape out a win. Whereas, you know, Emperor, Archmage, Yogg-Saron, Flamestrike, and two Cabalist Tomes, suddenly if you get to the late game, you still feel like you're chilling, right? Like you feel like yeah. you're in a good spot still. And I really like the addition of Antonidas to this deck. I mean, if you play Cabalist Tome and get a bunch of garbage, hey, let's just and have then, three and fireballs. And discount it all with Emperor. <laughs> yeah, right? and then discount it all. And just, just turn it into a card you actually want, which is finish your opponent's face off. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's an addition that's been long missing from this, where people relied a little bit too much on Yogg to close things out. I agree. But, so that's interesting to see. And Yutori, he claims that he's f likes playing Rogue more than any other class, and he's going with a pretty traditional Rogue lineup. Yeah, he is one of those Rogue players, it sounds like, from the, the interview information that we have. Rogue is probably the class with the most loyalists in mm -hmm. this game, honestly. Like, weirdly, the second is probably Priest. Yeah. Um, oddly enough, like these priest players who are priest loyalists have been beaten down into the ground to the point where even they're not playing priests anymore, whereas the rogue loyalists are hanging on. But certain classes do just seem to connect with people more than others. And rogue is definitely top of that list that people favor. Yatori seems to be one of those guys and no particular huge twists on his opinion on how you build rogue right now. This is more or less the list down to even the one SI7 agent. Wow. which is a bizarre um, turn on the deck that, you know, Chucky was was playing um, recently in, in the Onog tournament. And, you know, Admirable... Uh, no, sorry, um, TJ casting that tournament said that, you know, he told him that that has to be wrong. Like, you just have to yeah. play two SO7 agents. Um, I would generally have the same stance, but a lot of people do seem to be moving this way and it's working out for them. This deck is is performing reasonably well in tournaments from what the, the, the outings that we've seen from it recently. And I made this point yesterday, but you look at Barnes in that deck and you think, why is Barnes in there? It doesn't do much. And then slowly but surely, every card does something with Barnes. Not every card, but the vast majority of cards do something, even if it's a bit of spell damage or gets you a coin or something. And before you realise it, it's like it's just the SI7 agent and the Edwin that don't. <laughs> Yeah, Everything else does something. Right. This is this is the kind of deck where Barnes is actually a cool card, right? It's it's a combo engine card, and those are cool. We want more of those in the game because combo decks are hard to play and they're interesting and games are different every time and all this cool stuff that you want Hearthstone to be about. Um there's a lot of decks where it's just jam Barnes on turn four, you know, hope I get a high main. And we you know, ideally I don't really want more Tuscar Totemics in the right. game. Right. This is this is just a, a combo engine deck where Barnes is on, honestly like played on turn six or turn seven a lot of the time because you're trying to get a card out of your deck that you can combo other cards in your hand with. So this is a, a this is the honestly the positive side of Barnes, like building your deck intelligently and, and being rewarded for it. Whereas um, you know the, the turn four Barnes and hope for a great outcome is, is is something that I'd like to see a little bit less of in the game personally. And I think that version, actually, of, of all decks, the sort of try and get a Ragnaros turn four, um, so far people have tried to use that in various things, Hunter, Paladin, whatever, yeah. and so far nothing too terrible has come from it. Well, yeah, I mean, the the Yasharaj Hunter deck, where you know, <laughs> Barnes and, yeah. and Yasharaj are the only two minions, that is scarily close to being a real deck. Yes. Because... Um, you know, about 25% of the time you get that interaction to happen where you get 3-4 Barnes, 1-1 one, one, Yasharaj, 10-10 ten, ten, Yasharaj on turn 4. Um, the win rate when that doesn't happen of the deck is around 35%-ish. You only need to like refine that deck a little bit more to push that number up to you know 40-45. Suddenly you're looking at a very real deck with a very real win rate. Right, and there's life coaches working on that deck at the moment. That's yeah, always exactly. that's always a scary yeah, exactly. phrase to say. Right. Yeah, if yeah. life coach is looking at a deck that might be broken, bad things can happen for the community. Um, but he's added one high main currently to. Obviously, it's nowhere near as brutal, mm -hmm. but it's a lot more consistent. So, 
interesting. It feels like the early day of, days of Patron a little bit, that deck, where nobody knows which way to go with it, but they know there's something lurking in there. Sure. Um, so back to the matchup at hand here, just to go over the lineups in full. Um, Yatori has a Malagos Yogdruid. He has an Aggro Shaman. He has a Dragon Warrior. He has a very interesting mid-range hunter deck with, uh, I think, like nine one-offs in the list, which is really strange. And then uh, questing adventurer Leroy Rogue. And uh, Napica has his, his Antonidas uh, Tempo Mage. He has the OTK patron deck that we talked about, a mid-range hunter, a mid-range shaman, and a Yog Druid. This is best of seven conquests that we are playing. One of those decks will be banned. Uh, we, unfortunately, do not often get given the information as to what the bans are, so we have to kind of figure it out as we go along and sometimes sound like idiots while trying to do so, but Hearthstone casters sounding like idiots, what else is new, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, talking of which, one Houndmaster in this Hunter deck, as I understand it, from Napica. Yes. I feel that Houndmaster is one of the very best cards in Hunter right now. It's it is um it's it's a bad pull off Barnes that definitely um mm -hmm. counts against it since Barnes has come into the deck um and also Napica's list is playing the the Argent Squire package which means it's a little less beast focused in the early game um so they're not they're yeah. not so all in on like banking a Hellmaster on turn four so I can I can get on board with it but I agree with you like landing a Hellmaster on turn four. Um, if you actually do like extensive testing, like actually hitting Hellmaster on a beast on turn four is one of the highest win rate things you can actually do in Hunter. And I feel uh, that not having it lowers your infested wolves and your high main just a little bit as well. Mm -hmm. It gives your infested wolves, your high main, just a little bit less sort of use as well. If you only have one Hellmaster. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, sure. I, I don't think high main needs too much extra sure. use to be included in the deck, but Infesting Wolf, I, I definitely agree with you. It is a much scarier minion when you always have a Hellmaster to back it up. So it'd be interesting to see how that pans out for him. Obviously, if he's willing to play OTK Patron, he's a man who's confident in his tech choices because you don't bring that deck and get to the semi-finals of a national championship unless you've got some um, nous about how you play the game. I mean, absolutely. It's 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 a it's a different lineup. It's one of the most unique lineups that we've seen. The the, the rest of the people bringing the the unique decks have kind of fallen by the wayside. The other interesting deck that we see is the Handlock from uh, from Oya that kind of struggled honestly. When Just we to saw cut it. you off for a second, I think that means that Druid is banned for Yatori and Mage from Napica. Nice. I think. All right, got him. All right. Well, we'll go with that for now. So I've got those both listed at the top as well, so that makes it nice and easy. So we'll go oh, with that too. for sure. Perfect. <laughs> okay, so Yatori's got the questing hand. We'll be looking for more removal. Okay, he's just all right. He's just mousing around at random. I was gonna say he's he's like he's sending back SI seven agent and questing adventurer with the coin. Like, no way is that his mulligan. But he was just uh, he was just mousing over all of his cards. There's a reason for doing that, by the way. There is. There is a very good reason for doing that. Tell me. Um, so the mulligans don't get revealed until both players have chosen. Correct. But if you don't click all your cards, you can tell which cards have been clicked. How? Well, you see the cards go red from your opponent when they're clicked. Do you? But you don't see which one's going to get removed. So if you click them all, they have, they have no idea. I which thought you saw open. no interactivity until after. No, the you see, unless they unless they patched it, you do see the red. Okay. Oh, interesting. All right, good to know. So, sorry to the guy whose tech I just spoiled there. I'll buy you a beer mm. later. Uh, somebody pointed that out to me recently. So, but as he was doing that, I'm pretty sure that's why he was doing it. So, All right, fair enough. Um, Interesting so start. Chose to keep the SI7 agent through back the questing adventurer, got the questing adventurer back off the mulligan. So, um, personally, in these really high tempo focused matchups, you know, when you're playing against aggressive decks, which let's be honest, is the majority of the meta, um, I'm a big fan of just having a questing adventure in my opening hand, especially against decks that are a little bit sparse on removal. Mm -hmm. Like in, if you're if you're able to make a huge questing early on, you know, get it up above five, so you're asking for beast kill command, which you know, if you've got your questing to five early, you've paired it with a backstab, you've paired it with a prep something, so you've probably cleared the beasts off their board, um, and then you're just asking for either for either so beast kill command or deadly shot to be able to deal with it. So well, it's such a huge deal early on. I was going to mention the deadly shot, but you've got to deal with it sometime, right? 
So you might as well just get the questing there. And if it gets deadly shotted, oh, your auctioneer or your second questing, something will live later that wouldn't have lived. It's not that you're going to have a whole board full of minions a lot of the time with this sort of slightly... I know, well, with Rogue, you, you have two minions maximum most of the time, unless you've just won anyway. Sure. And against against other classes as well, your consideration of not going in with a questing early is to say, well, I'm going to conceal it later, and then that plays around their removal. Against Hunter, that's just not the case. Like, Deadly Shot will take out your questing regardless, unless you're able to conceal two minions, like you said, but even then you're in a 50-50 situation. So, Anyway, interesting that he sent it back, but he did keep the SI7 agent, which will be useful at some point, especially with the 3-2 inside that kindly grandmother and another huge toad in hand. That SI will probably get some work done at some point. But it looks like now straight away, just a 2-2 questing on the board. Wow. wow, just not valuing it at all. Uh, Yuturi, I think, was the guy yesterday who didn't want to take nine off a fairy dragon, and that didn't end well for him. Correct. Um, he didn't bump into it on turn two, and it, it, it just kept hitting him for the whole game, basically. Yeah, and I think I think that was a really big mistake as well. I think that, that had the potential to cost him the whole series if he wasn't able to pick up the win in this exact matchup. Pretty much, you know, where it was, it mm -hmm. was he won his rogue against a hunter deck that was tech to beat his rogue. So um, he had the potential for that that misstep with the fairy dragon early on to really put him in trouble for the whole series. And um, I mean, this honestly, I, it, this just speaks to a complete difference in philosophy from Yatori in this matchup than I have when I played this matchup, where I really value questing as one of my strongest cards, and Yatori just considers it a throwaway option that he doesn't need to win this matchup. Yeah, I mean, he's he's using it as a removal spell in fairness. Like, it's something that has to be killed, so it's, it is automatically killing the 2-1. Yep. Um, but there were other ways of doing that that sort of kept your win conditions alive. Maybe he just likes his hand. Maybe it's because he has got the Skulker, and he, he feels that he doesn't need to win with a, a quick, concealed big guy. He's just going to grind it out, which seems interesting, but... He does have a sort of hand that is capable of grinding things out. Yeah, and this is a strong turn if he wants it. He has the, the ball clear and the tempo swing here with a hit into Grandmother and then coin Dark Eye and Skulker to take out both of the three twos. That looks pretty much perfect for me. Careful, you don't want to be grabbing that Leroy just <laughs> yeah. yet. You know, that's the card you want, my friend. And that is a pretty big swing. Uh, Napica does have the bow, which is you know Hunter's real only way of removing things without losing too much tempo because they do maintain that that second bow swing for the follow up turn. But nothing to pair with it right now. If he chooses to remove this four three, that's his entire turn. So honestly, I feel like we might just see him develop here. Yeah, and it's worked out well for your toy. Like we're you know not we thought his decision was a very different path to what most people would take, but. The fact he is able now to just get this tempo or initiative, whatever you like to call it, and go with it, this might work out really well for him. Might well. And uh, Napka does choose to develop the bow, and I think this is uh, just a consideration for the matchup he's facing, honestly. Very similar to Tempo Mage, I guess, Rogue, where they thrive on board tension, right? They want you to play minions into their minions mm -hmm. because then they can tempo out with their removal spells and start directing their minions to face. So I definitely respect the option from Napica to, to go with the bow here, but it, it just feels like a miserable turn because now there's the distinct possibility that he's just going to be stuck in this same position every single turn for the rest of the game where he has to choose between dealing with a minion or dropping his own. You're always kind of feisty today, playing with his cards, emoting before the Barnes shows up. He's obviously a sign of somebody's feeling fairly confident. Maybe... His um his notes say along the lines of I I just here to have fun something along those lines. Whereas Napica on the other side <laughs> was the guy that I picked out as a man very much of my mentality. Where the quote that he provided us was, "What is the point if I'm not winning this?" So yeah. Yeah, very different stances going into this game, but that right now it looks like it's Yatori who's in a commanding position with with Napica not having any real way to fight back against this Azure Drake and. Neil Lorinda Bond, in your expert opinion, how many times have you left an Azure Drake alive against Rogue and not been punished for it? Right, yeah, I don't remember having ever not been punished for that. Rogue has just too many ways of abusing that spell power, especially, as I keep saying at the moment, with all the curve decks, just plus one of anything anywhere is gigantic in matchups at the minute. Uh, Deadly Shot is not a bad pickup here. That can actually be used as a decent race tool here because Napica's hand is all damage at this point. He has zero chance of winning this game on the board anymore unless some serious Call of the Wild things happen. 
So that deadly shot can actually be used as a strong racing tool here. That's not the huffer he was looking for. Uh, so he, I mean, right now that's basically the only light in his in on his uh, on his highway in front of him is how low the rogue health total is. He has a bow equipped. He has a kill command in hand. He has unleash in hand. But right now he's just going to lose the race to that seven a turn that's on board in the form of the minions. Yeah, Yotor is just going to be able to go about his business here pretty easily. Um, with the hand he has and the fact he's just not got much to deal with, he should be able to just put up a board that wins the game soon. But not quite that close yet. As the, the Japanese production is showing us, Call of the Wild would make a bit of a difference in a hurry. Yeah, so he's actually going to choose to try and compete on the board here. I'm not sure how successful this decision is, but he honestly may have reflected that choice on the fact that he didn't roll Huffer. He may have just been letting Animal Companion decide his strategy there for the rest of the game. If we saw a Huffer there, then I think we would have been on the face plan. Um, but with the Huffer not available, he's he's just switched back to attempt the board control for now. And honestly, his, his faith might just be back in the Call of the Wild at this point. Yep. Yeah. Uh, loads of ways here for Yotori to clear this up as well. That's why he's taking so long, because he has too many options, not because he doesn't have enough. Uh, I yeah. quite like this... Yeah, put that back on the table. I like it. Uh, not not enough mana for the the Drake fan of knives though, which would be ideal. I mean, he can't he can't Drake backstab and fan mm -hmm. of knives, which would be the the glorious full clear. So the the fan will allow him to um, clear up all the beasts on the board and mitigate the the effect of things like kill command. But if he plays fan of knives, he will be unable to develop another minion this turn. So he would just be seeding tempo. So. I think we might even just see a backstab used here on a 1-1. One, one. No. Okay. Yeah, I thought we might. I thought that it wouldn't be too bad, actually, just to clear this all out of the way entirely. Play around any Houndmaster, any kill command, or anything, anything, and just clear it all up. Because his hand is going to do so much damage next turn anyway. Well, it, it played around Call of the Wild as well, essentially, right? I yeah. Think the two t the two turns, the two plays that turn are backstab one of the dogs and hit the other dog with yep. a 3-3. Three, three. Or just go face with the three three. So I have no issue with the line he took. Like you know, trading into one and not backstabbing the other one would have been ridiculous. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or back backstabbing one and going face with the SI also would have been inconsistent. But, but with Leroy cold blood in hand, I felt that he might as well just clear up here. I agree, um, but you can also. But it's going to work for him. Yeah. You can make the argument to say with Leroy cold blood in hand, I want to push the three to face. Right. Like it, that's equally valid. Yeah, that's going to work because he now has exact lethal. So. He yeah. does indeed. Worked exactly out how he planned and takes a 1-0 lead with his favourite class. But Napika, we've seen, you know, he was calm yesterday under a lot of pressure from various ruling issues. And I'm sure this will not get to him at all. Yep. And uh, Napika does pick up the first win with his rogue, even though, uh, he, as we said, he is one of those rogue players in his uh, pre-tournament interview. He said that Rogue was his favourite class and he had a lot of faith in it. But in his in the match we saw from him on the first day, he struggled with his Rogue a little bit, honestly. And it wasn't until he, weirdly enough, until he queued into his opponent's deck, which seemed to be tech to beat Rogue, that he was able to pick up uh, a win with that Rogue deck. So him getting over the hurdle at the first portal call this time will make him feel a lot more comfortable in his Rogue pick for this tournament. I'm a little bit concerned about the bands we have listed, by the way. We think it's going to be the Druid and the Mage, but mm -hmm. the Mage was a featured deck. True. So that would be an interesting production decision to show us the featured deck that is banned, but we'll see. Well, I mean, we like like we said, we are we are working on on secondhand information here, and at, at best and at worst, no information. So. And um, we would love to be able to see that screen that you see just as a little micro clip at the bottom there. That caster screen, which has a little graphic on it, which appears to be showing the bands, but we don't get access to that, unfortunately. Right. So we're just going to have to go with the fact that it's probably Rogue and Mage. And if it's, if, sorry, Druid and Mage. Rogue's banned as well because it's one. You're not allowed to use it again. I guess that counts. Yeah. I bailed well there, yeah. Yeah, that was that was a fantastic recovery, as always. <laughs> When, when you make as many mistakes as you do, Neil, you learn how to recover. Yeah, I give lessons in how to recover from messing up. Great. My claim to fame, guys. <laughs> hey, everyone has a role. Just embrace it. Just uh, put over your fellow caster. Thank you yep. so much. You're welcome. Um, I make everybody else look good, though. That's true. And uh, we do get this weird 
thing where they use pen and paper to note down the decks and sort of the players point at which deck they want to play next. And this is what's happening here. We, we're almost certain that's what's happening. It happens after each game. The players point at a thing on a piece of paper. The two guys confer in front of the fake fire. And then they run off. And we play Hearthstone. Yeah, and honestly, like this, 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 this Japanese production, the admins here do seem to um, put a lot of faith in just pen and paper and wanting to have like a hard copy of everything. And based on the, the technical issues that we saw yesterday, they are quite right to be doing that because we had some technical failures on a lot of the the, the computers and internet connections, etc., at the venue mm -hmm. yesterday. So without all the pen and paper backup, they might have just got into a complete mess. So. It ends up being a good decision for them just to take the extra time <laughs> making sure that they just have a hard copy of everything. And here's the mage deck that we didn't think we were going to see. So get a good chance to talk about this deck now. Um, yep. It's a deck that picks up a lot of, or lack of respect from pro players in general. But as we talked about, Asmodai making number one legend with a similar variant of this. And yesterday, this deck seemed to be a powerhouse as well. It really did, yeah. I mean, Tempo Mage was the probably the standout deck of the tournament. And one of the big talking points that we kept coming back to yesterday was that Zoo has kind of been shoved out of this meta and almost replaced with Tempo Mage. Um, the, the big four decks in, in Japan seem to um, be favoring Tempo Mage in that lineup alongside the Dragon Warriors and Yogg Druid and Aggro Shaman um, over the Zoo, which is really, really interesting to me, especially with all the developments of the, the Discard Zoo, etc., coming out recently. So, um, Yatori here is going to be trying to go with some, some ruthless aggression here with his quicker build of Hunter with the Argent Squire package, uh, coming up against Napika's Tempo Mage here. The slower Tempo Mage as well with Double Cabalist Tome, Emperor Thorasan, Archmage Antonites. Yeah, and the Babbling Book showing... Oh, I'm angry. Is... I'm angry, Neil. You're angry? I'm angry. Why are we, why are we making what did, you angry? What, what did I say to you before we even came on air on day one? I was looking at this list with like nine <laughs> one-offs. There is one Argent Squire and one Abusive Sergeant in this deck. And I said to you, he is just going to rip Squire into Abusive off the mulligan every single game. And he and has done so far. Is. Yeah, he did in the first game we saw him do as well. Uh, the players have been given the opportunity to change decks from day one to day two. Uh, but most of them, not surprisingly, don't seem to have taken advantage of that. Uh, obviously, having one evening to change a deck you've probably prepared for weeks is usually not the greatest idea to change too much. Right, it seems like a, a strange decision to even present the players with that option because it's not like we've entered a new stage of the format, right? It's like this is one 16-man yeah. bracket and we've just stopped after we hit top four and we've gone to the next day. It's not like they've come out of groups and have now had the opportunity to change their decks. But those are the rules. You can't argue with them. I mean, that's that's pretty much what you have to deal with when you go to any tournament. It's just, you know, what are the rules? You know, if you If you can find ways to abuse the rules within them, then go nuts. But you have to stick to them. And even if there's a weird rule presented to you, you just got to find the way. But as you said... 24 hours notice to adapt X to, to what you're seeing. It's not a huge amount of time to, to try and make some strategic changes. I don't mind it as a rule in general, by the way. I mean, it's definitely strange. It's definitely not something we're going to see too often. But yeah. you get your chance to react to your half of your opponent. Like yep. in the first game and in the third game, you get the chance to say, OK, I'm playing against Napica. He's known for his OTK patron. I'm going to play an extra flame strike. Sure. Etc, uh, etc. Et and I don't mind that. I think that... One of the small downsides of big tournaments is the fact that it takes away the the head-to-head -head thing about it all. Yeah, and it makes some sense as well because we saw in the first match, um, Yatori, for example, clearly had his rogue targeted by his OP yes. opponent. Um, and that seemed weird to me because I'm not really a fan of, you know, I'm going to counter my first opponent and then not worry about the rest of the tournament. But if you can suddenly just change your decks after you've just won one more game after that, then it makes a lot more sense. But... Um, Yatori here, you know, I, I had a little bit of a moan, I guess, about the Squire and the Abusive, but the important pickup here for him has been the Kindly Grandmother, because this is kind of the annoyance to Tempo Mage in the same way that Zoo used to absolutely destroy Tempo Mage purely because of Haunted Creeper and Nerubian Egg, because Tempo Mage does not want to pop open Death Rattles before they start firing spells at your board. Um, it, it just wastes too much mana and makes them inefficient. So Kindly Grandmother almost works in exactly the same way, and it's a really irritating card for a Tempo Mage to have to deal with. And as is, 
a 2-1 with Divine Shield, the horse yep. rider. Another irritating card. Uh, interesting how Napika chose to play the previous turn, just leaving the Grandmother there until he could deal with it in one go. Uh, but this must be so tempting right now. Just shoot missiles at all these one health minions. Yeah, it does look pretty tempting. But again, he just he has a decent shot of increasing the power on the board. Does have the frostbolt to pack it to back it up if the grandmother does get popped open. But it's it's going to be a lot of resources spent. That is uh, pretty much perfect, in fact. Yeah, this is going to be just a nice clear now. And frostbolt the three two coin the ping mirror images if you want it, which I'm sure you do. Uh, I can actually yeah, of course, just yeah. drop the second sorcerer alongside it. I so mean... he's not going to ping the two one, but he's going to have enough defense that doesn't matter the only punish here would be unleash the hounds yep. which he doesn't pick up so these sorcerers are going to sit or apprentices are going to sit around causing a lot of trouble now yeah and without those apprentices uh without the the mirror images sorry um yatori's game plan was laid out pretty well for him here even losing a big chunk of his board there his aggressive start allowed him to go down the line of bow plus hero power this turn, second charge of the bow plus hero power plus something else on the next turn, and then suddenly that kill command goes face, and suddenly he's staring at Call, Call of the Wild lethal on turn 8. So those mirror images tanking up 5 damage right there is actually a huge deal for the, the texture of this matchup for Napica. So he should play this babbling book pretty quickly here, I feel. Um, just because he may have to react to something weird coming off it, I think it's fairly likely he's going to play it. Uh, he could, I guess he's wondering if he's going to keep the coin for Antonidas next turn. But Do you Babbling Book here, or do you just as your Drake, is my question. I guess that's Babble, what he's thinking. I mean, you, Babble, you... Babbling Book allows you to just ping off the 2-1 and protect your, your Sorcerer's Apprentices, which are obviously really powerful cards. And yeah, with two Apprentices on the board, the, the potential upside of a Babbling Book spell is just so huge right now. Yeah, and you can coin as a Drake if things look good or bad, whichever way you want to word that as well. I mean... Now you just don't. Now you just ping and... Take your time. So, I mean, a, poly, a, a one mana polymorph for a potential high main next turn from Napica's perspective is looking pretty glorious. Yeah, he's going to add up the numbers just to see if he wants a 4 2 babbling book, and he doesn't, unsurprisingly. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, he, he could make the aggressive line here, but definitely from, from Napica's perspective, there, he just wants to polymorph his opponent's high yeah. main for one mana next turn. So, And he has. Just building up this damage, and this is where the Archmage is going to come in massively handy if the game goes much longer, because if somehow Yatori can withstand all this, Archmage might just get that last bit of burn that he'll need to win the game for Napika to finish the game. Yeah, so Yatori just considering his hand right now and whether he can race his opponent. So he could potentially at least push another 7 this turn. That puts his opponent to 11. And then he has activated Beast plus Kill Command plus the Hero Power on the next turn. That's seven more, so that's puts him. That's fourteen damage total. So he's down to four health, and then Call of the Wild is lethal. Yeah, it's an option. It's Here, an there, option. there is a there is a buttload of damage staring him back on the board. So I don't think he lives two turns going back the other way, which is the problem. Yeah, and he needs to force some damage through. He wants his Call of the Wild to be game breaking, and against Mage it might not be because they can just Mage you in the face. And I, yeah, he's he's pushed some damage, and I like this. I think. I. Don't like him playing the Direwolf this turn. Uh, so the extra one point of damage means... Oh, no, no, this is fine. Yeah, yeah. no, Because, no, yeah, even unactivated Kill Command plus Hero Power next turn puts him to five. Yeah. And Call of the Wild is still lethal. And this puts an extra 2-2 two -two on the board that his opponent has to deal with right now, which might buy him the turn that he needs to win the game. Yeah, those things. Um, but I think Napika might just have enough damage here. Like, he can factor in Call of the Wild quite comfortably... Uh, he'll be more scared of something like Fiery Bat Double Kill Command will definitely be on his mind right now. I mean, he has 22 minimum this turn with Fireball and Polymorph Ball. So if two shots from Flame Waker go face here, he just has lethal. If two shots from Flame Waker here don't go face, then he's clearing the board. Yeah, he's got a decent chance of that happening, honestly, because one of the shots killing the three one obviously makes the others 50-50 each. So Polymorph Ball for another aggressive four damage here. Where these shots go are going to be a big deal. And this is, yeah, I mean, it's, he either wins the game or he clears the board, right? <laughs> so, that sounds good, right? Because yeah. clearing the board, we can see, wins the game as well, barring a crazy top deck. That, and okay. that he isn't it. Yeah, he's just going to decide to hold on to the fireball, which is valid as well. I, I really don't see the harm in just casting it on the previous turn because, like I said, there are only two two outcomes: you you win the game immediately, or you kill the two one anyway. So, 
He chooses to hold on to it, so that's fine. He wins the game either way. And Napica is going to square up the series with uh, this deck that, as we said, is is catching on in the East at the same time that it's catching on at the West because Asmodai has just secured rank one legend with a very, very similar looking list. And note to self, if ever getting rank one legend, do it five minutes before just before, before an HCT cast. Just so you get casters saying your name on it. Yeah, it just seems yeah. like the best time to do it. Right? Seems reasonable, right? So, yeah, anyone out there getting number one legend, yeah, just delay it until just before next Saturday when we get the championship event. Yeah, so. so so Tempo Mage in at number one with a bullet there, and he... that Just the decision to use the fireball at the end, it's a, it's a very, very minor thing, but I, I, I do question it, but his play seems to be very much on point today so far even in the game he lost didn't seem to be an awful lot he could have done um, there was the decision to equip Eaglehorn Bow to try and clear instead of develop which kind of forced him onto the back foot the whole time but I, I you know I can understand the fear of wanting to clear out rogue minions so he seems to have uh, tidied up some of his nerve issues from yesterday and seems to be playing a lot stronger today but I think the real test is going to be when he has to bring out that OTK patron deck this yes time. yes see what sort of um mood he's in when he gets that out there i like the play with the sorcerer's apprentice it wasn't i mean it was obvious when you see it as always but it wasn't a naturally obvious play like the pings and stuff are the things you look at first normally when you've got one apprentice already in play yeah so you know he's awake enough to get into those sort of plays that sometimes you can overlook in the heat of the moment and so I think oh you, mean, you mean playing the the double apprentice yeah play the second off, yeah, apprentice so. where he had sort of ping and missiles and stuff all looked fine he just went no you know what i can leave this up put down the taunts and get a really good looking board sure and he snowballed that through so So coming down to the lineups again, there are three out of four, since we just found out that what we assumed were the bans were wrong. Uh, there are three out of four for uh, that Hunter for Yatori, which we know is, is in the lineup, having just seen it. Dragon Warrior, Agro Shaman, and the Malagos Yog Druid. Uh, for Napica, we have uh, three out of four of the OTK Patron, the Midrange Hunter, which we know is in his lineup because we've seen it already. Uh, the Midrange Shaman and the Yog Druid. So one of one out of each of those those will be banned from each side, and we are going to see a good old fashioned Hunter mirror. So has anything changed? Is the slightly quicker Hunter the better Hunter? Uh, depending on the one drops, of course, which is a bit of a wild card in this one. Mm -hmm. I mean, before Kindly Grandmother, I think I would say yes. I think Argent Squire, Direwolf, Abusive Package. Put you in a really strong spot because they mm -hmm. your opponent just played three twos and you had the option to just tempo out and trade into them with a the divine shield um now kindly grandmother changes that equation a little bit because kindly grandmother is quite prepared to go toe to toe with argent squires and abusive sergeants um so i don't think that gives you as much of an advantage in the hunter mirror as it used to um honestly i think the hunter mirror is just it's just really really swingy honestly and it's it's a very curb dictated and and now sadly quite a barnes dictated matchup a lot of the time uh you tell me they're having to put the screw back in by the way one of those players can't bear to have that screw hanging around on the map <laughs> so, so yeah just getting that early game then just drawing one into two like even though he has a lot of one-offs he does have a decent number on each casting cost yes it's not like he's just played one Argent Squire and said, I'm going to draw it every game. You know, like some people used to play one Zombie Chow, for instance. Um, Indeed. <laughs> as you well know. I do. Um, but he, he has got a decent number of things on each casting cost, so it's not quite as surprising as it seems when he keeps drawing a good curve like this. But again, this is literally Argent Squire into Abusive Sergeant. <laughs> This is not him drawing two one drops. This is specifically him drawing Argent Squire into Abusive Sergeant, having played one of each in his deck. That is crazy. I mean, why play two if you're going to draw them anyway? I, I mean, sure. Um, Napico have pretty difficult decisions to make here as to how he wants to develop. I think this is definitely the right way, though. Setting up the 3-2 against the 1-1 one, one and thinking, well, my opponent's probably only got one Abusive Sergeant. He can't keep drawing it. Yeah, he is vulnerable to, to Direwolf here. That Animal Companion is a beautiful yeah. draw. If he doesn't get the Leoc here, he can just coin out the Abusive Sergeant, and he still plays perfectly on curve with the Barnes, but he gets the Leoc anyway, he gets to save his coin and his Abusive Sergeant now. Right, and Napica here. This is the hand I was on about when I said about the one Houndmaster, by the way. Sure. 
This is the hand where you really would like a Houndmaster to be sat there for turn 5 or turn 6. But let's see what Barnes can do for him. That'll do. Yeah, we'll take it. Um, and the smile on Napica's face says it all, I think. The Savannah high roll. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> it's just... Ah. For, yeah, that card... Not a word I like to use, but that card seems to fit it perfectly. So, yeah, Barnes is a little gross. I think just going back to the high main discussion, I think like, it's 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 the thing about revealed deck lists, right? When when the deck lists aren't revealed, I think there's actually merit in only playing one Howlmaster in your deck because your opponent has to give you credit for Howlmaster anyway. Yeah. So if your Infested Wolf is on the board, they have to think about. Ha ha! All right, fair game. Wow, a high main what, on each what side. What are complaining about? This is everything is absolutely fine. And both players are having a laugh about it as well, so yeah. which is kind of unusual. I'd be crying by now. I mean, what what would you have to cry about? You have a free high main as well. But my Your opponent's high... just done the Argent Squire thing, so that's true. Anyway, Ooh, that that Tundra Rhino could potentially be a tiebreaker here, though, because that allows him to charge the two twos from his from his high main. Yeah. But does that provide him with any real advantage right now? Uh, probably not enough to bring him back onto this board. But he probably has to go for it. Um, he can clear off the Leoc, for instance, uh, using the two five itself. <sighs> he can. So it would be what Rhino into the two four, High Main into the two one, and then yeah, the two twos tidy it's up not a bit. Fun, but oh, okay. This is yeah, this is fine. Yeah, and then just uh, one two two left of hanging around spare, I guess, with not much to do. But yeah, it's not all that impressive overall, is it? Um, uh, Nutori, I think you know, having equalised the pull off the Barnes with the yes. high main, his superior early game start has just secured his position in this game. Uh, and they both do have Call of the Wild to back it up. The interesting thing is that Napica has the power of the mid-game minions here and, and Yutori really doesn't. Yutori just has straight damage. So uh, it'd be interesting to see how this game develops over the next couple of turns. Something you said at the start of this game, I think is good for the state of Hearthstone when you said, you know, this is honestly a really swingy matchup. Yeah, and something that's happened in the last three months since Whispers of the Old Gods is matchups do have this back and forth about them now that Blizzard have been trying to make happen, and that's something that didn't exist much maybe six or eight months ago. Yeah, you, you mean you mean like you can predict who's going to win the game less on turn three? Yes, right. That you can actually come from behind now if you either play patiently or if your deck's built to come from behind. Whereas on you know when it was Secret Paladin versus another secret paladin now you, you could usually predict who was going to win from turn two turn three onwards and the game was over whereas now you know this game not so swingy but in general i think hearthstone's got a lot more comeback mechanics than it had before yeah you see japanese production there highlighting one of the cards that will of course be hugely important if napica wants to make a comeback here which is unleash the hounds which, which would look very very promising on this board um, no such luck for Napica right now. He just has the pile of mid-range minions, which, as I said, in some situations would provide him with an advantage in this matchup compared to the hand that he's facing down. But when he is trying to fight back from behind, he would much rather have something that looked more like Yatori's hand, where he could just clear up some of these minions and then curve into his Call of the Wild to try and restabilize the game later. And he does have two of those Unleashed Hounds, which a lot of decks don't these days, but... So he has got every chance of getting them if he stays alive long enough. Yeah, which, for sure. which is definitely in question, right? He's starting to get eaten up a little bit here. Hero power over the Argent Squire just considers that the Argent Squire isn't going to do anything on the board there. And there's there's two twos and there's a one one kindly grandmother that will take care of it pretty easily without it actually achieving anything. So uh, I'm okay with that decision, just trying to push through a little bit of damage instead. But yeah, Yatori has decided that that Infested Wolf is a sign that is a minion that's too irritating for him to deal with. He gets to push 7 plus 2, 9 damage this turn, backs it up with Kill Command, Quick Shot, and the Call of the Wild. So Napica is going to have a serious uphill struggle to try and mitigate all of this damage now. Yeah, and no hounds for him means that he may be having to just try and get a Misha from this a Misha from this animal companion just to slow things down a tiny amount. Yeah. And you, you highlighted one of the points of this deck being the lack of Houndmaster. And again, it's just a, a card that he'd love to have in this situation, right? Just to be able to try and make a push back the other way. 
Yeah, and you know, taunt when you're trying to slow down your opponent in a race is important. Huffer looks good, but I'm not sure it's that particularly great. Helps him tidy up a tiny amount. He may even choose to go face with it. I don't know if he, how long he can stem the tide anyway. I think Huffer trading into one of these two twos is just resigning your fate. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, the, the three three can happily trade here, but I think that Huffer does just always have to go face. I, I just don't think there's any way against a lot of classes you could do this. You could try and neutralize the board and rely on Call of the Wild yeah. here, but Hunter has inevitability just through the hero power, which you know sight unseen. Even if you didn't know the damage was in hand, you know that every turn that passes when you're the person that's at a health disadvantage is in their favor just because of the hero power. So um, I think that's great recognition from Napica that the the uh, the Huffer did have to go face here. You told you just double checking because this is one off lethal. Uh, just double checking that he's not making a giant mistake. Actually, he hasn't got a beast, so it's not one off lethal. He does have does a the beast. grandmother counts as a beast the, before both, the fox? Both parts of grandmother are a beast. Right. Because the grandmother is, in fact, just a wolf in grandmother's clothes. Sure. So, yeah. Um, so, so right, in, in almost any situation, the play here is just do it, leave him at one, and then, you know, don't die yeah. yourself. But the question then becomes, do I die to Call of the Wild? So there's there's eight damage, 11 damage on the board right now. And then uh, Call of the Wild will add five more for 16 and three more for 19. So he does survive Call of the Wild. Then you look at, do you start die to something like Kill Command Quick Shot on the V-Swing? Probably not, so... Looks like he's going to put him down to one, which makes every bit of sense in the world. Yep. And, and Napica is going to get the sad news. He's going to count his Call of the Wild damage himself, and he's going to get the unfortunate news that it's not going to be enough. And we set it up. The inevitability of that hero power is going to get him there in the end. Yeah, Yuturi going to take a 2-1 lead. And again, just a reminder, we're not sure what's been banned, but what he has left is Dragon Warrior, Agro Shaman, and Maligos Druid. Two of those three decks. Dude, Napka just going through the motions here. Can't blame him. He said he's here to win, so he's going to make sure that he has uh, every opportunity of finding himself some miracle out here that no one else can see. But of course, there was nothing available. The damage just wasn't there, so... Uh, Yutori is going to go out to the 2-1 lead here and picks up wins with his Rogue and with his uh, slightly unconventional um, Reno Hunter with no Reno in it. Uh, <laughs> being, yeah. being facetious, there's something like 9-1 wow. in the list. Like it's, it, it just looks like a really inconsistent list. It keeps working for him because he does keep drawing strong openings. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very, uh, very teched out hunter, if you want to put it that way. But he does keep uh, succeeding with it, picking up the wins where he needs them. And he's in a good spot in this series, as you said, with just two out of three decks of Dragon Warrior, Agro Shaman, and the Malagos Yog Druid left to win. I like Napika there taking his time before conceding that game. I think it's good practice to keep yourself playing at the same speed that you're comfortable playing. If you suddenly just concede instantly, get into the next game, start playing too quick, it, it can snowball you know, mentally. So happy to see him take his time there. We're playing for a place at BlizzCon, effectively. The winner of this goes to APAC, the winner of that goes to BlizzCon. So right. just take your time. Uh, I've heard other casters say, yeah, why isn't he conceding now? Well, why should he? <laughs> Always my answer to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with you on that. The, the stakes here are huge. Um, I, I've made, I made the point yesterday that, you know, you you have probably cast more of the the Eastern Hemisphere tournaments mm -hmm. than, than any Western caster alive, um, depending on like whether you consider D2 a Western caster exactly, or not. Exactly, yeah, D2 is the other one who's cast a lot <laughs> of these, yeah. And it's, you, know, you, you are telling me that Japan is one of the strongest regions and that the Japan representative will go through as a potential favorite to, to win at APAC. So the, 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 um, the stakes of winning this tournament are potentially huge in terms of going into APAC as a favorite to take on that BlizzCon spot. Uh, from what you've seen, do you agree with that assessment? I mean, you've seen sort of eight or ten of the players in this top 16. I think there has been uh, a couple of players, uh, two, maybe three players who've impressed me, you know, played notably well. There is, of course, yeah. the, the caster meme of, you know, he, he played fine where, you know, we were critical of a few of their of their plays. I think most people in this tournament have played fine and there were two or three that had really standout performances. And I think I think that's pretty much on par with what we see in like major 
um, top tier North American tournaments or mm -hmm. top tier European tournaments, for example, where most people are playing solid and there's one or two standout performers. Um, so yeah, I've been in, I've been impressed with the level of play overall. I definitely think that Japan will go through to APAC as a as a strong representative. But speaking of strong, that opening hand from Napica is looking exactly that. Yeah, it's just going to have to work out exactly how he wants to do it. I mean, that's always the only issue when you get this sort of hand. Uh, how do you feel? Just take your time, two or three turns. You can wild growth on two. You can't really wild growth on one unless you want to... Unless you want to innovate out Drake on three into Violet Teacher, I guess. Yeah, coin wild growth, innovate Drake, Violet Teacher is possible, but your opponent has always also had just a, a low pressure start, which you know Dragon Warrior always will when they go first. Um, they can't coin Alex as champion. They can't coin Fairy Dragon. They're just sat playing a one three or a one one if that's even in the deck on on turn one. So. Um, when Dragon Warrior is going first, you do actually have a little bit of breathing room to be able to set up your plays if he does want to skip turn one and then go for the Wild Growth line, try and pick up something to innovate and coin with the teacher later on. So I'm okay with chilling here for a turn, I think. And I don't like putting the teacher on the play on, on the board on turn one. And the reason I don't like it is if it gets executed, you're in a world of pain. Yeah, I mean, it is purely execute. Here. Yes. Yeah. Um, what I... Like, the... Normally, turn one teacher, you snap turn one teacher. It's just like with the texture of his hand, um, Drake and Scenarius, he's like relying really heavily on picking up something to do on turn four for a start mm -hmm. and then to fill gaps all the way up to Scenarius. Whereas since it was a low pressure start from the Dragon Warrior, he could have just slowed down, just used the, the wild growth and then gone to teacher. And then he still has that innovate in hand that could potentially bring him all the way up to Scenarius at a later date if he picks up other plays. So uh, the Raven Idol pick up here is going to fill the gap for him. Almost guaranteed to pick up something to do here. Swipe works just fine as well. Yeah, and he'll probably prefer Swipe uh, because of uh, Ravaging Ghoul. So he won't want to sort of bump and kill with a teacher and make a load of 1-1s, one have a 3-1 teacher. Feels like that is just asking for trouble. I think he might just swipe this. Right, he could potentially Raven Idol and look for Wrath or Claw, something along those lines, which will help him clean it out. But, you know, Swipe isn't a, a hugely valuable card in this matchup. It's valuable in the sense of there are a lot of four health things that you like to kill with it. Azure Drake, Blackwing Corruptor, Fierce Monkey, Frothing Berserker, etc. But that's the job, right? You kill a four health thing with it and you move on. It's not like there's any real token generation in the deck where you need to clear up a bunch of 1-1s one mm -hmm. with it, so... I like using the swipe here and just pushing through. Yeah, and the bonus of getting a 1-1 one, one if they can't kill it, which, as it turns out, Utori can't, is actually pretty huge. So uh, Napika's going to be able to keep riding out this momentum that he's got from the turn one innovate as, yes, that card. That's yeah, the card I, he wants. Yeah, the Ravaging Ghoul is exactly what he was looking for there, but doesn't get the chance to pick it up. But yeah, now, I mean, now it's it's the potential for him to get a little bit stuck because of his choice to go so fast. But it honestly doesn't matter too much at this point because he's got himself so far ahead. But, you know, like I say, if there if there was some something of a backswing from Yatori, this is the point of the game where he may have got himself a little bit stuck by going so fast with the Yogdruid because... Um, right now, he could just have another Innovate in his hand if he'd slowed down, but his line has worked out absolutely fine. The Raven Idol pickup and the Swipe pickup has provided him with enough stuff to do in the meantime to get in there. So he will just again be looking up for a play from this Raven Idol just to fill him a turn here. And if the first one doesn't work, then he's got a spare. Choosing to kill a 1-1 one, one there, so losing out on two damage that he could have put into the Azure Drake, but... And we can see he can't deal with an army of 1-1s right now, but maybe he could put his faith in drawing that ghoul anyway, as he's going to struggle to deal with his drake at any point. Takes Soul of the Forest here. So, I mean, it, it was a bad pick. That Soul of the Forest would have been ridiculous if his Violet Teacher was still alive, but luckily Yatori was at least able to find the Corcoran Elite to charge into that. Oh, rage will do feral nicely. rage. Clear the board, keep hitting. That's what he's been doing all game, and that looks like that's the right play again here. I mean, Nourish is appealing because he has, you know, what's that, 26, 30 mana in his hand already. So being able to ramp up would be pretty appealing to him. But Feral Rage just clears this out right now. He doesn't need to accelerate his mana because he's ramping straight into Ancient of War next turn. And he knows 
if there's an execute in his opponent's hand, it's one of the two cards on the very right of his hand because his teacher sat there not getting executed for at least a couple of turns. Right, and so next turn is going to be the Ancient of War. Turn 8 going to be Soul of the Forest plus one of the things he drew in the next two turns. And then it's just scenarios. And then if the game is still even going, into Yogg if needed. That seems like a really good plan. Does. And you see Bookworm on the screen. Bookworm is you know, such a strong card, honestly. I mean, I, I completely like misrepresented the card when I first saw it, when it was first revealed, because I didn't it didn't even occur to me that the card was targeted. I thought it was just Kodo um, in dragon form. Uh, but the fact that it's a targeted card makes it strong enough that even in a really, really aggressive deck like Dragon Warrior, it even finds its way in as a one-off. We saw Chucky playing it, for example, in the in the North American scene to, to good effect, making his way to the final of the, the Onog Major. Looks like Yatori is having a bit of a latency issue with his client here. His his attacks and spell animations are taking a minute to go through, through here. So hopefully he's able to stabilize here because... The last thing Napica is going to want to say, see here for a sh for sure is a regain because he will consider himself massively favoured to be winning this game right now. Yeah, and there wasn't lethal on the board at the time, so it would have been a regain um, unless the rules are something that we haven't heard of. But every other HCT event is just you have to have lethal or to stop admins having to make tricky decisions. Yep. So now this is this is a sticky turn for for Napica. This is a little bit awkward. Violet Teacher, Soul of the Forest is a huge uh, amount of of board presence at least, but it doesn't allow him to deal with any of the problems in front of him. Doesn't have enough power to get through the three six uh, without a hero power. So if he hero powers though, all of a sudden he's not really utilizing his mana too well unless he wants to have a nourish turn. Then that's handing back too much initiative. So. I think it is just Violet Teacher's yeah. Soul of the Forest, I right? guess with Scenarius in hand, having this sort of board presence is actually fine. Yeah. Um, your opponent probably can't clear all four of these things up. And if he can, it's still two twos. Your Scenarius buffs them. You should probably be able to clear on the V-swing. And the absolute worst case is you set up a decent Yogg. Yeah, 100% agree. The Soul of the Forest board state is is so awkward to deal with, and we've we've forgotten about it a little bit, really, because this card was almost becoming standard in the in the Token Druid before you know Arcane Giants came along that we suddenly had to find room for them in the deck because they're completely bananas. Um, it was it was just the standard. Everyone was playing Soul of the Forest, which you know going way back was probably like ridiculed as one of the worst cards in the game. Honestly, like no one ever played it. Um, Jackie Chan egg druid made it come 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 in with a splash for a while but apart from that it was just so amazing to see that card doing work and still raven idol is keeping it fresh in our minds by just popping it out every now and again right and i think that a lot of innovation took place in druid decks because of raven idol sure. uh, people just said oh this card seems to work over and over again like nourish uh, was a card that at the start of whispers wasn't been playing a huge amount mm -hmm. and then every time you raven idol and took nourish you're like oh I know. Let's let's put this in my deck. It seems really good. But I think also Nourish came about because of the nerf to Ancient of Law. So yes. Druids just had to find themselves a card draw engine from somewhere else. Ancient of Law is it's it's impossible to overstate how core that card was to Druid strategy right up until the point where it got nerfed. So they needed to replace that in some way with a card drawer effect. But the Scenarius buff here is going to be absolutely devastating allow him to break through and push 11 damage to face conveniently 11 damage being exactly the number that yatori is sat on which means napica is now going to square up this series with an incredibly aggressive yog druid opening innovating the teacher backing it up with removal all the way through series tied at two games to two right and again we don't know the bands yet unfortunately but Napica looking more and more solid as this tournament goes by, I'm feeling. Uh, if he does get through this into the final, he'll definitely have a presence there, I fancy. Yeah, like we said, it was a it was a bizarre situation early on where in his first game, he looked shaky for the first couple of games. Yeah. The game where the actual mouse disconnect issues happened looked shaky, but even before that, he made a mistake in popping a mage's ice block, which could have turned out to be really relevant, where he, he popped at two instead of one. Um, and was of like noticeably upset about it, just yeah. looking at his player cam. So since that mouse issue, it really did seem like a switch just flicked in his head, right? When he, 
he had that moment to sit back and you know he, he was talking to the admins and trying to figure out what was happening so it seemed like that time just not having to focus on the game did him the world of good in terms of being able to refocus his play because since then he's he's been playing pretty well i'd have to say yeah it's just a just the strangest thing to refocus somebody like we've seen players go to pieces in um, especially one of the china championships where there was an issue and then the next game all you can see is a guy sort of shaking his head and playing badly like literally just ruined him and yet in this event yeah, for, for somebody to suddenly gain composure after a, something that should like put you off but he took it really well it's like we, we saw him we didn't have any sort of commentary obviously to to help us but we saw him sort of pointing at the screen and sort of shrugging as if to say yeah that, that was me that's that's how it came across he, yeah, he didn't, my he didn't bad. protest <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he found out where he stood he called the admin and found out what his situation was but at no point did he look like he was expecting anything other than the game loss for it yeah so it looks like we are just about ready to get into game five and yatori's yog druid making an appearance here so uh he's going to queue it back in napica is going back to the well with his mid-range hunter now for the third time i think both of his losses this series have been with this mid-range hunter yep they have and this is Maligos Yog, I believe, from Yatori as well. From Yatori, yes, it is. It is a Maligos deck, yes. So uh, this looks like a pretty reasonable hand. Obviously, he won't keep it all, but he'll keep a large chunk of it, I should think. Well, maybe he won't. Maybe he'll just throw it all away and go for the ramp. Yeah, okay. I mean, pow Power of the Wild against Hunter, not really too yeah. appealing. It's, it's just going to trade one for one at best with some of their stuff. If the yeah. opponent has Argent Squire start or Fiery Bat start, then it's going to do even worse than that. Um, trading down for tempo most of the time. So I think throw it away, look for Living Roots, Innovate, Wild Growth, and your four drops is what you're going for there. So picks up uh, Living Roots and the four drop. If he's able to fill in this gap with some ramp, he's going to be looking in, in much better shape. Yeah, and Living Roots so spectacular against these x wands in hunter so uh obviously slightly awkward for him with it being fired back uh, do you ever moonfire here and just put down two one ones uh seems ambitious i mean you are essentially protecting both of your one ones 50 percent of the time with the the moonfire right by moonfiring uh -huh. first and then setting off the battle cry but is that worth having two one ones on the board are the one ones that important to you in this matchup do you think so going the other way, is Moonfire that important to you in this matchup? No, but I, I think it can it can have it can have better usage later on, especially when you already have Malagos in your hand. I mean, you're you're going to ramp up to the to to. Or you mean your game plan at least is to ramp up to be able to spend nine mana mm -hmm. way before your opponent. So they're going to be spending six or seven mana. So that Moonfire could potentially help you deal with a high main with a little bit of board presence as well to take out the two twos. And so I think there's some utility to it. I think, you know, these 1-1s one -ones are most of the time just going to trade evenly with a 2-drop, I guess, which secures the board for you for one more turn. But how much does that really do for you? I'm not sure. But he, he chooses to go ahead and do it. And uh, I, I can see his line of thinking, at least, where he wants to have both of these 1-1s one -ones on board to secure the board for him for one more turn because his hand is a little bit slow. Um, I just think the utility of the, the Moonfire as a board control tool light, later might be a bit more valuable. Especially as it was only a 50-50 shot that it was relevant. Yeah, sure. that's that's where you're going with it, right? Because people tend to assume like play around the worst case scenario, but actually, you know, when you when you do the math, fifty fifty is oddly enough fifty fifty. No so way. you've got to factor that in. Uh, do we ramp here? You always ramp here, right? Otherwise, Zixo tells you off. You always ramp. Um, he's uh, yeah. I mean, I have seen people generate two twos in aggressive matchups, and it it seems so appealing to have that two two. But you really have to sit back and tell yourself that you're paying five mana for that two two. Yes. Right. Like over the course of the game, you're going to have one less mana the next turn, one less mana the turn after that, and that's going to go all the way until you hit ten. That can be mitigated slightly by the fact that you're probably going to ramp a little bit more on the other turns. Um, but it's such a huge price to pay for a 2-2 that it's so very rarely worth it, even if you think it is based on the board state. One of your favourite cards in that lineup there, but the Corrupted Seer is probably worth considering at least. It doesn't seem awful in this matchup, right? It, it seems like a thing that could get some work done, but Stranglethorn Tiger is just a thing that he can drop next turn. It's, he doesn't really have a play in hand for the following turn unless the Raven Idol spell is going to pick him up something that he wants to play next turn. 
Uh, so Stranglethorn Tiger just being a playable thing that he can drop on the board to maintain initiative just seems pretty strong. Yeah, especially as he's, I mean, he is actually the aggressor in this match. Incredibly, that's how it's panned out. Not anymore, though, but just for a moment. Yeah, he's, he, he is the one with the board presence. He's the one with the chance of winning this fairly quickly. And there is just no way in hand to deal with Fandral Staghelm. And this is not a situation that ever ends well for a player who has to leave Fandral up. And look at Yatori's face. A, a, a visible intake of breath from Yatori there as he says, Oh my God, my Fandral lived. Look at this turn I have now. It's absolutely nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and the giant Noish covers up the cars for us. And we get... A decent selection, actually, there. And drawing first will help him choose better from this Raven Idol. He did consider Raven Idling first, so he could use the mana if needed. And then realised, hang on, that's nonsense. I, I'm always nourishing, so he nourished first to find out what happened. Yeah. I like um, the charge minion as an option there, by the way. I do, indeed. I do as well. I think it gave him the option to uh, pick and innovate off the follow-up spell as well. So he could um, play the charge dude, innovate, and power of the wild as his whole turn, and then really tidy up the board. But... Definitely can't argue with Argus either in an mm -hmm. aggressive matchup because right now he's looking at his health and thinking, I actually can't do a great deal to deal with this board this turn, and I'm already sat at 20. So some protection for my life total might be pretty useful right now. Yeah, keeping back the Moonfire this time seems inconsistent. Um, could have Moonfired that Divine Shield to stay with the, the plan of trying to keep the board clear? Well, he can Moonfire the Divine Shield at any time. Well, not if it bumps into the 4-2. I guess he kills the 2-1 then, but... Sure. What, di what difference does it make? Well, it may get buffed by those great Houndmasters that buff non-beasts. Hang on, right. sure. Yeah, there's literally no difference. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly the same thing. Later. But it, all, you, all you do by waiting is provide yourself with the advantage of maybe not being able to Moonfire it, and you just picked a swipe off the Raven Idol. So. Sure, so that would have been horrendous. Yeah, there's, there's just no reason to take the shield <laughs> off with Moonfire. Okay, moving swiftly on to a game that people are playing. And freezing by the look of it that may be spectator bug but the players looked a bit concerned there they did and i'm gonna take from the production cutaway that we are having some issues uh looks like we're getting back into game pretty quickly here though yes we are so um yatori is just considering his uh spell damage swipe options here which look pretty fantastic honestly uh innovate would have been the dream pickup here but he can now uh bump into the kindly grandmother with his panther he can swipe the high main and then that Moonfire that we didn't use last turn gets yeah. to take out a 2 2. And Call of the Wilds looking way too slow to do anything here. As you say, that um, that 5 mana 2 2 that he didn't play working really well for him right now. He's used that mana every single turn, so. Yeah, as I said, he has, of course, ramped his mana with, uh, with Nourish a little bit, which you know reduces mm -hmm. the impact of, of, of not having the 2-2. But as you said, he's used all of his mana on every single turn. So if he'd have had one less mana on all of his key turns, then he would have been in a serious mess. Including not having the Nourish on the Fandral. So Right, exactly. Okay, so the board can be cleared, but how do you win if you clear this board? Do you rely on your Call of the Wild beating eight Druid cards? I mean, that seems really ambitious. It does. And you haven't... He needed the, the one or two turns after there wasn't a full clear from Yutori on the Fandral turn. Because the Fandral turn was absurd. But as I said, like the one downside of it was that he couldn't really address the board properly at the same time. Um, so he needed that one or two turns after that just to be incredibly aggressive and really set him up a lethal win condition. It hasn't quite got there which means now this pickup of Defender of Argus can potentially be completely insane for Yatori and enable him to put the pressure straight back onto the Hunter and take honestly take cards like Call of the Wild out of the equation. Yeah, and it's going to work out really nicely for him, like you say, and just got to be careful how he wants to plan, which minions he wants to buff, clear everything up so Call of the Wild has no impact at all. And... Okay, choosing to buff up the, whatever they're called, the saplings. Yeah, the saplings. I, this is, I, I love this. I mean, the point I was going to go on to make about taking cards like Call of the Wild out of the equation is that right now, from Yatori's perspective, he's looking at the one card in hand and saying, the only way 
I'm I'm losing this game mm -hmm. is if that is kill command and I lose to straight damage, which I can't really play around, or if it's call of the wild and I lose to board presence. Um, and if it's call of the wild, he gets to pick with the card defender of Argus where the huffer has to go. So why make the huffer go into a five five Azia Drake when it can go into a two two root? Yeah, and it works out really nicely because that's exactly what's going to have to happen here, I think. I mean, you, you don't have to attack with a huffer, but then you just set it up the same way anyway. Because the 4 1 just goes straight into the Misha. So, yeah, he has to do this. Yep. And that is just about the most pathetic Call of the Wild I have ever seen in my life. That is achieving <laughs> pretty much nothing. That is a, a huffer into a 2 2 and a Misha being taken out by a 4 1. The Leop just gets value traded. It's. It's a miserable call of the wild. And I imagine that makes you very happy. I am I'm not the world's biggest fan of this card. I imagine that. Indeed. Um, he could have played the, the Blood Mage there and used the extra spell damage to, to have a more efficient Wrath. But he decided, that, you know, absolute safety. Let's get that one extra armor. Sure. Um, wait, what, what would Wrathing for three achieve? No, he could have Wrath for four. He did Wrath for four. I'm going, I'm losing it today, guys. <laughs> I'm just the game's over, right? I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. So Wow. So unleash the hounds here. If that unleash was paired with kill command, would that be enough? Two go um, in, three two, go face. Yes. No, he'd be one off. He'd be one off, right? Because of that one armor he'd be. Because of one the one off. armor he'd yeah. be one off, yeah. So it was relevant and he had countered that for sure as well. Oh yeah. I mean, it's it's one of the first things that comes to mind, right? When you're in a seemingly unlosable position against Hunter, it's like, don't let yourself get into a mess where you suddenly lose to uh, to Unleash the Hounds. So, Yatori has navigated this game brilliantly. The Raven Idol picks have all worked out perfectly. The decision to ramp instead of playing a 2-2 in an aggressive matchup has all worked out great. And uh, it's seeming incredibly unlikely that there's any win condition here. I'm sure we'll see the uh, the frog traded out here since somehow he managed to not pick himself up lethal in this, in this yeah. ridiculous looking hand. And he's just taking a moment to work out how he dies um, because he has the option to wild growth here. He does, yeah. Um, he's he's going to bypass the Violet Teacher. He was thinking like Violet Teacher, um, innovate, wild growth kind of things. Hey, he's done hey, it. He points hey, at them and do. counts them, yeah, and counts them again because... He's just whiffed three times in a row and beautifully done, realising he just doesn't need that Violet Teacher. Yeah, great stuff. Um, putting himself in a, in a strong position this series. And again, that was just a really well-played game of Yogdruid. There were, you know, sometimes that deck is pretty autopilot, right? Sometimes that deck does just win games by itself because it is so powerful. Sometimes... It, it just curves out too powerfully at the start. Sometimes it just comes down to a Yogg winning the game for you. That wasn't one of those games. Like, sure, Fandral hitting Nourish and not being dealt with was a huge deal, but there were a lot of important decisions in that game, like picking up Defender of Argus as, as the minion off Raven Idol, choosing to ramp with the Maya Keeper instead of the 2-2, which I'm sure, like, chat is screaming at me, like, of course you ramp, everyone ramps. But we have seen that mistake made at high levels on more than one occasion. People have taken the five mana two two option several times in high profile tournaments. So. Right, and we've seen arguments on Twitter between people who can play the game very well take yep. place, and the people who say you always ramp win that argument every time. <laughs> <laughs> it's like probably by shouting loudest, but they still win it. Sure. Okay, so he's down to the Dragon Warrior, which means the Agro Shaman was banned. We are reverse engineering here, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, but Dragon Warrior, and it's got to beat OTK Patron. Uh, mid shaman and yogdrid and hunter so oh, it's already beaten so what's gone not having the bands is throwing me horribly here otk patron is left mid shaman is left and hunter is left yep and obviously one of those has been banned and we don't know which one Exactly. Um, so yeah, I mean, we would love to be able to provide you with the bands. I am, I'm trying to fight the battle to get someone to provide us with the bands for for every game. But you know, we are just providing essentially a community service here with this stream. This is a, a Japanese tournament that is broadcast in Japanese. We are just community casting it in English for you. So we are just trying to work with all the information that we can get. I mean, I will, I will continue fighting the good fight to try and get us some some information, but. These are very busy guys who have an extremely 
uh, complex production of their own to look after. So it's it's no great surprise that we are not too high on their list of priorities. But if we can start getting ban information through, that would be lovely. But yeah, and something Africa, that D two sorry, sorry go on. Oh, you uh, go. something that D two always points out when he does the Japanese broadcast is you know we want people to see as many of the different players who go to all these championship events like APAC, EU, NA, as possible. So when you get to BlizzCon, you've got an idea who you're watching. 2014-2015, uh, there were players that people who aren't paying attention to the nether regions of Twitch didn't recognise. And, you know, this stream is trying to raise the profile of that. So hopefully bear with us when we do have some problems like that. Nether regions of Twitch, Craig Asim. They sound terrifying places. <laughs> <laughs> Deep, uh, dark places. <laughs> anyway, moving Finley. swiftly on. Finley picked up on turn one by Yatori, which is a big deal. Gets a board control hero power as well, which is also a big deal. Fiery War Axe being picked up. Things keep getting better and better for Yatori here. Uh, Napika, again, just continuing every single loss with this mid-range hunter so far, and he's going back to it. I mean, I've called it mid-range hunter. It feels like Every build of Hunter is mid-range Hunter because you go all the way up to um, Call of the Wild these days. Um, but this is the slightly more aggressive, I guess, hybrid list that's playing Double Squire and Dire Wolf, etc. So. Yeah, I was looking through, like, making my notes earlier, the Hunter decks, and they're all different. And every one I just wrote mid-Hunter. And yeah. I ended up writing, like, Aggro Hunter by one of them at random, which I think was Yatori's, just to distinguish the fact it had some more one-drops. Mm -hmm. But it's still a mid-Hunter build. We need We need better names for Hunter right now. Right, because originally, like, Hybrid Hunter was the name for the aggressive Hunter that put High Mains back in, but, you know, every deck is still running High Mains now. It's rare to see a Hunter deck in, in the last month, at least, or so, that is has gone with the cut High Main plan. So it's it's kind of getting a little bit hard to classify all the different variations of Hunter, but that Huffer role for Napika is not what he would have been looking for with a 2-2 on the board. And how do you feel about him not taking at least the value trade into the 1-2 there, knowing that he's just going to die on the board to the 2-2? Two -two? Yeah, I mean, he seems to feel that he needs to hit face. But taking a value trade there, I don't think he's getting his role correct by not taking it. Dude, now, Yatori is, is feeling himself right now. He is in the zone. He's playing so quickly. He can feel that this game is just so overwhelmingly in his favour here that... He is just making the initiative plays that he can on every turn as quickly as possible. He wants to get this over with. He wants his spot in the final right now. Yeah, do you think there's any advantage at all in winning the first semi-final as opposed to the second one? Like, you get to sit and relax yeah, and watch I, I, your opponent. I do. I, do. I think um, most tournaments do deliberately schedule a slightly longer break between yeah. the second semi-final and the final to try and mitigate that advantage a little bit. But I think the advantage still persists. And we have this um, bug again with the observer mode or whatever it is that keeps happening. So we just wait for a moment. The players are talking to each other actually this time as well. But we're back. Hey, our good friend Barnes <laughs> High Main has appeared again. That, that was all. That was was the the Japanese production team wanting to to milk the suspense of the Barnes turn. Or just put High Main on the board so it looked like it go to seven games. Sure. <laughs> but Yatori here, suddenly, look at the instant change in demeanour from a yes. guy that was obviously incredibly confident on the previous turn and now, just off a card, that just plopped on the board on turn four, suddenly he feels like he can lose. Why, why is one card in Hearthstone that swingy? Right, and something you've said about cards, if, if they make you feel sad or happy based on one roll... Yeah. One one result on the card. That's a card that hopefully doesn't see much competitive play. So Yeah, so Yatori has to uh back off his aggression there because of the presence of the, the micro high main and uh just go in with the, the board control strategy. Still a, a, a clean Azure Drake ahead on the board now at least. So he's still in a comfortable position, but you can see how much of a setback that was for him because he was just snap playing every single turn. He was in a incredibly comfortable position. That high main has just slowed him down. The question though, Lorinda, has it slowed him down enough? Is there any room for Napica to find his way back into this game? I mean, the first thing Napica's got to do here is decide, like I was talking about his role before and I thought he might have it wrong when he started going face, but he's got to reevaluate his role given that he's just had a thing that has happened to him that has allowed him to get back in the game on an even footing. I think he can actually trade here and then redevelop the board. But he doesn't know what he's up against. We can see that Yatori's hand is 
not good for occupying boards. Not yeah, brilliant, at least. The absolute worst thing he can do, the worst decision he ever will have made in his life right now is trade Infested Wolf. And I'm honestly, I don't think that's that bad of a play sight unseen. I think you can ration that that is a strong play right now. Yeah. And this is going to get absolutely body bagged by Yatori's hand right now. You have all the things he could have done involving horse riders and quick shots and stuff, which all were sensible, but this did look fine. Look how savage this turn is. That's absurd. And going back to the swingy games, like decision made by Napika there could have been a different decision and led to a very, very different outcome. And again, not calling it a mistake at all. Just no, that is a just important decision. Play, sight unseen. There is nothing wrong with it. It just so happened to line up perfectly against Warax and Ravaging Ghoul. But, but we all know that Hunter has a better turn eight than Warrior, right? Sure. Yeah, that, that happens every single game. But Except this time. I just want to talk about quickly. Snap call for Yatori to go face instead of uh, trading into the 1-1, one, one, which leaves his 3-1 Alex Strasser's champion available for the trade back on the board. Thoughts, Neil Lorinda Bond. Hmm. I mean, the fact anything's a snap call at this point is slightly scary. Sure. But I don't mind. I don't mind. He's he's thinking he's going to win with this with Ragnaros, I think. Uh, I think so too. And I, I think he knows exactly what his turn is next turn as well, especially now that um, Napika has gone ahead and taken the damage for him. So he doesn't even have to swing this war axe at face to activate his 9-9. Nine -nine. There is a 9-9 nine -nine on the board. He's threatening lethal this turn. He'll be threatening lethal next turn with the Ragnaros. Napika. He's actually got lethal without the Ragnaros. That's how dangerous this is. I mean, even if the 9-9 is dealt with, he just re-threatens sure, the next sure. turn with the Ragnaros. So, um, Horse Rider, Direwolf, quick shot, not enough damage, right? 3-6. He'd have to bow it with his face, and then he'd just die to uh, the War Axe and the Hero Power anyway, from his perspective. So, And there's no way of playing. There's no zero mana cards. There's no taunt. There's no anything. And... Oh! Oh, oh Yutori! Nemo throws Ouch. it out there, and Napika, the man that said, "What is the point if I'm not winning this tournament?" has got to feel terrible about it because he is not winning. He is going home. Yutori is the man that is going to take his seat in our finals coming up a little bit later for the chance to take their seat at the Asia Pacific qualifier. Yep, yeah, Yutori. We saw him yesterday. I think he got off a shaky start with his rogue deck in the first match we saw in the round of 16, but he seemed to play a bit better as that match went on, and today he seemed to play a bit better again. So he can use this half an hour or whatever's coming up, hour and a half, to to get himself relaxed. And he's the guy that's here to have fun with his friends and play some Hearthstone. And honestly, I would, I would advise him to, uh, to take his own advice and just go away and, and relax for a second, because he was notably i think caught up in the emotion a little bit in that last game we saw him you know not being particularly uh expressive or emotive in the in the first few games and then you saw the momentum ride for the first few turns right where he was just feeling really really comfortable wanting to get the game over playing incredibly fast then we saw the visible reaction to the high main that could have pulled his opponent back into it and then after that we saw him slip straight back into the mode of just you know playing too quickly so i think if there's anything that's going to hold him back from being successful in the final, it's maybe a little bit of that overconfidence as he got towards the finish line. Um, so I, if I were him, I'd go away and just take a look at that, tell yourself to slow down, consider all the plays, you know, no matter whether it's game one or game seven. Yeah, and remind yourself you're there to have fun. If you're there to have fun in the first place, if that's your natural attitude, suddenly becoming serious is probably putting too much on yourself. Yeah. Like the guys who are serious from the outset, those are the guys that I always fancy to win these events. Uh, but if you're one of those guys who's just optimistic, happy-go-lucky, enjoys life, I don't know if those guys exist. They don't exist at this caster table. But <laughs> <laughs> if you are one of those guys, you can't suddenly just change your personality and become all mega serious because it will destroy you from within. So. Yeah, that's definitely a point that I've made repeatedly where um, I think some people are criticised way too much in terms of, you know, being expressive and um, or playing quickly, for example. You know, if, mm -hmm. if that's if that's how you feel comfortable, then I'm a big advocate of just doing you and just, you know, whatever makes you feel comfortable, just keep doing it. But um, Yatori just seemed to bounce back and forwards between playing slowly and playing quickly based on, you know, the emotion of the situation, which is a sign that you're being affected by outside factors. Um, and that's something that he should probably take a look at. But 
He has done incredibly well to win that series. He's booked himself a spot in the final. We have one more semi-final coming up for you, which is going to be Gundam Flame, who's my standout player of the tournament, coming up against Oya, which will be coming up in a little bit. And there's a very similar matchup to this one in that you've got a guy who's saying, I did bad, I didn't, wasn't impressed last time, I want to do better this time in Gundam Flame. And Oya, who's another guy who just wants to enjoy this with his friends, mm -hmm. the phrase, again. So be interesting to see. The, the enjoyment guy won the first game. Let's see who wins the second game. Just bear with us for a second while we talk stone to see exactly what's going on. But we're probably going to go to a break and I'm probably going to just cut our mics and let you enjoy the adverts in Japanese in a moment. Yeah, it looks like there is just some sort of uh, slightly extended interview this time. They're doing very quick interviews, but I guess as the, the stakes are rising for the wins of these players, they're doing more uh, extended interviews to get to know these players' personalities a little bit more. So... And we are just hanging around, waiting to see whether the broadcast is going to go to a break here. But either way, we will probably take a, a short break very soon just to uh, give ourselves a rest before the next series. And we'll be right back with you with uh, Gundam Flame versus Oya very soon. Yeah, take care, guys. I'll put the sound on for you and we'll see you shortly. そういった中でランダム要素を使っていくっていうのは自分の中でどういったことを意識してここでランダム要素を出していこうみたいなのってありますかいやもう基本的に普通にプレイしてて勝てない時はもう運任せみたいな感じで使ってますねいやまあそう